audience member. Okay. Um, and I'll call the Finance Committee of March 29, 2022 to order at uh, 9 a.m. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being on time. And we're going to try and be expeditious with this. So I want to uh, first note that uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting is uh, conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish uh, who are attending um, can do so by Zoom or telephone. Um, and uh, there's going to be no um, uh, in-person attendance by members of the public, except as uh, we call on people uh, to see if they're interested in participating in public comment later in the meeting. Uh, so I want to make sure that um, we account for um, who's present from the committee and make sure that everybody can hear me and be heard. So um, with that, I'm going to start with uh, Lynn. Um, Present. Okay. And uh, let's see, uh, Bob? I'm here. Okay. Uh, Matt, for everybody's attention, I'm going alphabetically. Uh, Matt has indicated that uh, he's not available at nine o'clock, but is hoping to join us later in the meeting. Uh, he's the one person who uh, had indicated that he had a problem when we had to change the date from last week. And I appreciate uh, everybody's cooperation with that. Bernie? Present. Uh, Michelle? Present. Kathy? I'm here. Okay, and I guess uh, you haven't heard from Alicia yet, have you? I have Lynn, not. Did you try texting her? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll let you know. Okay. If you get anything back from her, hopefully she'll be joining us quickly. So, and we have uh, two members of the staff, uh, three members of the staff here. Um, um, Athena's present. Are you doing the minutes today yourself, Athena? Yep, Bill is unavailable today, so I'm going to be with you this morning. Okay, well, thank you. Appreciate your being here. And we have Sonia and Sean. Sean, are we expecting um, uh, the DPW people? And if so, at what time? Um, we are not expecting them. Um, I think that item was going to be an update um, from probably Kathy, Bernie, and myself. Um, just to let the group know where we're at with the um, study of water and sewer rates. And I have asked Guilford for an update, um, which I can share uh, what I've got back on that. Okay, well, I've answered my second question, and that is availability. Um, the agenda is on the screen, and uh, so the, um, now that we've called the meeting to order, the yeah, second part of item number one is just to review the agenda and see if there are any questions um, or preference of order in which we take this. Um, my thought would be, unless there's a disagreement, to do the, uh, trying to think about this for a second. Um, if we have action item, I would probably want to hold that um, and see if we get either of the um, members who are not present to be able to join us. So to do the water and sewer rate first. Uh, but uh, is there any feeling about that? Okay. Um, the other thing we might do really quickly is the minutes of the last meeting, since that's fairly simple. And I did have a couple of suggestions and uh, I'll tell you what they are real quickly. This is the minutes of March 1st and on page, um, 
think it's uh, page two, if I'm correct. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes. On page two, under discussion items, it says under at the uh, first item, assessing university and college property, it quotes you, Kathy, say, um, is saying uh, in order to potentially uh, raise their tax bills, well, they don't have tax bills to raise. So I was going to suggest um, changing that to uh, pot uh, potentially seek payments in lieu of taxation if allowed by revision to state law or by agreement with these institutions. And I can, uh, I have that actually in consent of later, but that, um, that was one change. So again, it's uh, after the word uh, potentially in the second line um, at the bottom of page two under discussion items. Got it. Thank you. Uh, right there, um, where potentially is the second line in, uh, uh, yeah, in that sentence. Yeah, that's that change is fine with me. I, I have, without listening to the tape, I have no idea what I said, but I know we couldn't raise their taxes. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so I said potentially seek payments in lieu of taxation if allowed by revisions to state law or by agreement with these institutions. And I can uh, send that uh, to Athena later um, as the marked up. And that on the very next page is, uh, the very next page as it's written now, um, where it says, uh, be excluded from being taxed, uh, from being, re uh, from being reassessed, I'd say from being taxed. It has to do with UMass, and we were to. Um, I think that the discussion was to think about assessing the UMass property, but uh, the problem was is that state legislation is proposed. It needs to be clarified about being taxed. So those are the two changes that I had thought about. Both are fine. Those are fine. Any others? If not, somebody can make a quick motion. I, I move that we accept the minutes of uh, March 1st, 2022. I second. As amended. As amended, yes. As amended. Okay. Um, and uh, I think we'll just go real quickly through the uh, Voting members, um, uh, Lynn. Yes. And uh, Kathy. Uh, yes. Michelle. Yes. And I'm a yes. And I think that uh, we have one voting member who's not um, present today. And uh, I'll ask uh, Bernie and Bob if you have any. If you're okay with it, um, this and we'll indicate that in the minutes. Bernie, I'm I'm fine with the changes. They're all appropriate. And, uh, yep. Can I just ask the the Can I ask? We're posting the minutes in the packet of the di current meeting, so that's where we should be looking each time. I just want to remind people um, because we had we had one question from an someone who thought we didn't have any minutes because they're not under the thing called minutes. If you look for minutes, they're under the packet. So you have to look at the packet. Um, I just uh, just wanted to alert people. Yeah, Athena. Andy, if I may. Yes, Athena. The draft minutes go in the meeting packets. The approved minutes go in the minutes folder on the finance committee page. So the reason we don't have the minutes that have been approved this year are is because there were some edits made when they were approved that I don't have. So I'm waiting yeah, to receive no, the approved. Yeah, I know Andy's, Andy's 
planning on sending those to me. So as soon as I have those, I'll post them in the approved minutes folder on the finance committee page. But the draft minutes are in the packet. That's right. And that will be done this week because uh, I'm finally getting caught up and I was had hoped to do it yesterday, yeah, but didn't. Okay, so uh, um, we'll get the minutes up to date, uh, but draft minutes don't go in that packet. Uh, are, are under the minutes page, and that's just standard practice for all committees and the council. So, going back to the agenda, then, uh, Sean, you had a suggestion of um, the, on how to uh, lead the discussion on the water and sewer rates, just to bring the new, bring us all back to where we were. Previously, and to uh, and then we'll have a discussion when you have a proposal. Yeah, um, Kathy and Bernie, is it okay if I start and then if you want to add? Um, so we had one meeting uh, with Kathy and and Bernie, who were charged from this group to sort of do this deeper dive into our water and sewer rates. Um, and at that meeting was myself, uh, the town manager Kathy Bernie, um, and Amy and Guilford from. Uh, from the DPW. And at that meeting, it was more of a, we were trying to understand what types of structures uh, we, Kathy and Bernie would like us to sort of look at and dive into deeper. Um, and, and they can provide more on that. But I think we talked about different types of block rates. We talked about an institutional rate. Um, and I think we talked about some other variations. Um, so after that meeting, uh, I worked with the DPW to, try to get the data from our system in such a way that we could model different structures and what the impact would be on, on individuals and their water bills. Um, so that took a little bit of time, but we were able to get um, some pretty good data out of Munis, which is our, um, our accounting system and our billing system. So we were able to get you know, every account, what their consumption was, what their, their, um, what their bill was, um, if they have a meter fee, because that, that's part of the rate structures is potentially tweaking what the meter fee is and, um, in addition to looking at the consumption fee. So we were able to get that all into a spreadsheet format. Um, we looked back a couple of years because we realized if we look at the this past year or two that the consumption is probably a little off in terms of um, what the what UMass uses, what Amherst College uses, those institutions. Um, so I, I believe we went back to 2019 for this. So we got that all in a spreadsheet. Um, we've handed that over to the Public works because they're gonna. They wanted to add some additional variables to it. Um, they wanted to add. They wanted. They, they were gonna work with IT and look at our GIS system and see if there was a way to add whether a, an account was a renter, a rental property or not. Um, to have that variable in there too for discussion. Um, so the last update I have from Guilford is they are. That's where they're at. They're working with IT. I think they're close to having that done. And once they have that done, we'll have this data set that they can then model the different structures. Um, so it probably means we'll want to set up another another get together with Kathy and Bernie at some point, um, maybe to look at that data to look at some sort of baseline um, options for for different structures and what their impacts are. And I don't know, Kathy or Bernie, if you want to add to what we talked about at that meeting, I know it was quite a while ago, so. Um, no, I think that summarizes it, Sean, because when, when we talked, what became clear, which hadn't been clear when Guilford first spoke to us, is basic data was an issue. You know, it wasn't easy for them to do what Sean just described doing on what if we did the following, um, because it's not kept in an easy format for them to access. Um, so my I, I just two comments. One, that there is a memo that Bernie and I did that the finance committee as a group approved going to DPW, and maybe I should just resend that so we have it as part of the record. I mean, because we particularly focused on the qu a quarterly rate that would be, and this was because of a recommendation we had as one possible way of to the size of the um, pipe or the meter, meter. So you would you would capture the large users differently than the small users. 
and the we talked about that being a way of covering fixed costs, um, whether or not. Uh, so when you hit a COVID world where UMass goes home and Amherst College goes home and other big users go home and suddenly we get plummeting revenue, it would create a more steady flow. So I, I thought I just should re, we might want to reshare that memo. Um, and my only other comment, Sean, on what you just said is I think the concern about rental properties wasn't everybody who's a renter. It was the large complexes that have a lot of affordable units in it. So I don't know what DPW is thinking of adding, but it was, you know, the the big the bigger um, complexes, um, and I don't know whether they can differentiate. But you know, so it wasn't a single home that is rented. It was you know 130 because they would be they presumably would have a different kind of meter and in, in total use, the building would, not each person. So I'll stop there, but I just thought maybe resharing that, particularly because Michelle was not there when we had that discussion. So we just make it part of the meeting. Um, I can, I, I'm sure I can find it somewhere. <laughs> Those are all good thoughts. Uh, uh, thank you, Kathy. I really don't have much to add there. I'm, I, I think, um, we're going to probably end up puzzling some over rental units, but I'm not sure how much of an impact um, that will have. It'll be interesting to see what they come up with. Yeah, I'm going to come back with uh, one other um, question of how to phrase, but uh, a couple of people have hands up, so I want to get to them. Bob? Yeah, I'm... Um we had a discussion, I don't remember what the outcome of the discussion was, about possibly looking at dual metering and separating out irrigation systems from regular water use. And will the spreadsheets be able to distinguish those two? Or can we maybe do some, you know, we could do some analysis to say that, you know, look at, you know, water use outside of the irrigation system and water used during the irrigation uh, time, uh, season rather, um, and then maybe try to estimate how much is irrigation and how much isn't. But I don't remember where we wound up with that discussion. You guys could let us know. We, we might be able to, to pull that out of the data. I'll have to look at it closer with um, our billing department. Um, I think in those situations, if there's a water bill and not a sewer bill, um, for the account that might signal that it's a an irrigation type situation, but I've got to look at it closer with um with the building department see if we can see that in the in the data that we have. Well, and just one point is they told us at that initial meeting that some but not all farms have two meters, um, and so this issue was particularly for those that don't, I think, you know, that it's all running through one meter. But right. in any case, there is a, a, the town, we have a provision, there can be a separate meter. I had thought it was a separate rate, but it isn't a separate rate, it's just separately metered. But in any way, it came up just that, and I know one of the farms up here only has one, because um, I asked them about it, and it's all through the one. Um, they got back, they got back billed because it was only estimated for five years, they were stunned. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. What we ended up doing in Hadley was uh, to mandate uh, a meter if you had an outdoor irrigation system, and then for farmers, there's a separate uh, agricultural rate for the water use. Um, but homeowners uh, or businesses that had uh, sprinkler systems for landscaping, uh, they had to install a second meter, and they were charged. Uh, a different rate. Right, that's what I was wondering, whether we can distinguish that in the spreadsheet um, for residential use. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll be, if, if they only have one meter currently, um, yeah. I don't think we'll see it, but we can mm -hmm. ask um, Amy and Guilford if they have a separate list of those types of properties that, it, that they're yeah, aware of. And you have to keep in mind that if you we look at what we did in Hanley, um, that was really, driven by the need to conserve water as opposed to uh, uh, yeah, so how rate, Bernie, how did the rates compare between the two sectors? 
I'd, I'd have to go back and look at, or look at what Hadley currently has posted on the website. Um, but uh, there wasn't a, uh, uh, you know, we had a, uh, an engineering company that was working with us on this and, and uh, they did, um, we relied on their calculations. The, because uh, I was on the select board when we had the discussion and uh, it, at that point, it was because there were several area farms that had raised the unfairness of being built for sewer on water that was clearly not ever intended to go into the um, sewer system. So the, mm -hmm. the, the goal was not on differentiation of rates. The goal was on uh, doing the um, removal of the sewer charges from their accounts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was required that they be the ones who pay for the installation of changes to the system that would in their property that would allow for dual metering depending upon how the water is being used. Uh, Lynn, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I, I just want to put this in a larger context, and that is we have three different things about water and sewer going on right now. One is we need to adopt the rates for this next year. The second is the discussion we're having now, which could impact rates, but obviously not for this coming year, okay? And the third is the whole water and sewer regulations. And somewhere, so as long as we agree that this discussion that we're having right now will not impact this coming FY23's rates. Um, and the regulations um, have yet to be seen when they're gonna impact, okay? And how they're gonna impact. Uh, I'm fine with this discussion. I just wanna make sure we're not trying to do this to impact the FY23 rates. Bernie? You know, all, all this was forward looking. Um, I, I think we had come to the, um, not a vote, but a, a sort of a consensus that the, the rate setting for this year would just go forward and that what we're looking at is, is future stuff. And I, I guess one last question then, um, that I have, uh, how would we characterize the goals that we're seeking in uh, changing the rate structure. That's Andy, that's why I thought resending the memo would make some sense because we did go through that and we talked about, um, you know, providing more certainty, covering capital costs, you know, the, the, and so this was the potential modeling whether we could do that or not. So I think if I resend that, we don't have to have that discussion again and then we could look at that memo because it did try to lay out why were we even looking at in a forward way without saying we are going to do this? We said we want to look at the what ifs if we did something like that. Um, and it was um, for this regular, the quarterly payment that was not variable with usage was to, per, to knowing that we're regularly going to have to invest in plant and in, in water water processing plant. So to be covering the um, costs, the capital costs of doing that and providing a little bit of a reserve. So we did we did lay that out. And I think it would be good just to revisit that memo and, and see maybe if we, we, I'm not saying we definitely were totally clear and we captured everything, but that was the goal of that memo. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'd appreciate that. The um reason that I brought it up is there are actually three new members to the committee since we had that discussion, Michelle being the only one who's present right now, Alicia and Matt are the other ones who are new as members of the committee since we had that discussion. So it would be helpful um, to resend that memo and uh, what we probably wanna do is for the two, members who are absent, um, urge them at some point to 
watch the video of this uh, portion of the meeting um, or the meeting until they join, if they're able to join, which would then enable them to catch up on this discussion together with the memo resend, which would uh, lace out the goals and then we're uh, able to come back to this later. And Andy, just a quick heads up and maybe for Athena, we lost um, Bob a couple minutes ago. I don't, I assume he'll try to rejoin, but he hasn't yet. And so Alicia I, will, will not be able to join us. So I will both resend and I'm gonna make sure it goes to either Sean or Athena so they can post as part of the packet. And when I resend, what I might do is we had a very good presentation from DBW um, with a consultant. So I might um, do a hot link to that because that started this whole discussion um, on a potential other ways of setting rates is what they presented to us. Um, so I will um, make sure I will do that after the this meeting because I'll have to go back to figure out when they made that presentation, what packet it was in, but it was in one of our packets. It was a very good set of charts um, that then triggered the memo. So. Okay, and if you don't uh, find it, uh, contact Sean or me because we, one of us is certainly, I, I have, I think all of the documents too, but I'm not gonna look for them if you're looking. Michelle, give your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll appreciate seeing all that, thank you. I just have more of a general question about this. Do we have complaints from residents about our water and sewer rates? Like what's the overall feeling? So um, is it okay if I respond to that, Andy? Yes. Um, I think we, where we've seen some complaints is sometimes around the issues of fixing or repairing issues. Um, and sometimes if things don't get caught, um, the way it works is if there's a issue with a read, we estimate a bill. Um, and sometimes if, if something for whatever reason falls through the cracks and doesn't get repaired in a timely fashion, those estimates can go on for some time. Um, and so the situation that Kathy described was a situation where for whatever reason, um, there were multiple years of estimates on a, on a, um, on a meter. And when it finally was fixed and the actual read was done, um, th they paid for the water they actually consumed, but it was a big, adjustment to get to the actual. Um, so I think that's where I've heard most of the complaints is around um, addressing areas that need to be fixed in a timely fashion and get, um, get them up to date. Um, we, we do look at our water rates compared to other towns and you'll see that in the, um, you'll get a memo sometime in the next few weeks on the water and sewer rates for FY23. And then I'll talk about that a little bit and you'll, you'll see how we compare to our neighbors. Um, our rates are not high compared to our neighbors. They're, they're, I think they were on the low end. We have made some um, larger increases the last few years because of some infrastructure projects that we're taking on, um, but they still, I believe, are in sort of the, the middle to low end of the, of the rate structure that when we compare to other towns. Can I just ask you a follow-up, Sean? Um, so when those residents got hit with the larger bill, did they have an option of paying it over time or was it require that they pay immediately. I'll let Kathy respond and she probably okay. <laughs> I think she knows, I think she knows the, the, the details of this one. Sorry, she said this already, Kathy, and I missed no, it. No, 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 that's fine. It, I don't think it came up in finance at all. It was a phone call that I received. Um, it was a $5,000 bill, just to give you a sense that it wasn't just a slight. And uh, there isn't, there there is an appeals process. And in this case, um, the appeal reduced that to zero. So there was an effort to that that the town said uh, it was our responsibility to be reading the meter and that we didn't read it for five years and you faithfully paid the estimated bill. So there is a recourse through an appeals process. But the other thing I just wanted to say that there's been a it's not been a regular complaint, but because we brought have had to do a major investment in a new plant um, and the combination of that and then UMass leaving town for a while, which created a shortfall, the enterprise fund pays for its capital. So people have seen a rapid increase in their water rates. So Sean is right that they're not necessarily high compared to other towns, but it's 
outside the regular tax system. So people go, whoa, my water rate's going up. So there wasn't a lot of, it, it created attention. I don't think it necessarily created complaints. And we will be seeing that when we see the enterprise fund proposal, you know, so we, we are going to have to vote on water sewer rates again, um, and that will be coming up. Can I add one more thing, Andy, to that? Sure. Um, one other thing just on that is, um, so as Kathy mentioned, uh, the DPW superintendent has the ability to abate. Um, so sometimes if there's a leak, you know, I remember when I first started the schools, we had a burst pipe behind a wall and we didn't know about it and we got this huge water bill. And, and so he's able to abate in some situations. Um, and then the other issue just with the estimates, sometimes it's not always the case, but sometimes the reason the estimates don't get fixed in a timely fashion is because we're not able to get access into uh, um, some of the meters are still not accessible to the outside. Um, so sometimes it does require coordination with the homeowner to get in and repair an issue or fix an issue. Um, not saying that's the, the, you know, the reason all the time, but that I know that's come up in the past as well. So other issues that were involved were uh, the discussion as to whether we could, um, and this is actually being uh, encouraged by the state and as a regulatory uh, issue that um, Amy Rusecki uh, talked about at some length, and that was um, to try and have a rate structure that encourages conservation of water because um, that's uh, an ongoing issue in all water systems, including ours. And uh, the other is the, uh, which has already been referenced earlier, the question of what's a fair way to deal with agriculture. And I think there was a third one, Kathy, and you had raised um, early in the discussion, which was um, very large users and what's an appropriate rate for very large users. So I think those were the kinds of things that we talked about. So is there um, anything else? Andy, we do have a cell phone number in the audience. I don't know if it's Bob, it could be Bob. Um, I don't think he has the ability to raise his hand. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Bob's cell phone number because if it's him, we could bring him into the room, but. He can raise his hand by pressing star nine on his phone if that is Bob. Okay, so Bob, if that's you, hit star nine. Okay, okay, it is, good. All right, uh, good, he's coming in. And then I believe it's star six to mute and unmute. Yeah, this is Bob, sorry. I can't get on the internet on my uh, computer. I'm having problems, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Uh, well, welcome back. Uh, so you missed most of the water discussion, but uh, what I what we did was uh, kind of just went through what some of the major issues were that were uh, we discussed in the in the prior discussions, and were uh, um, a little bit of a report on from Bernie and. Uh, Kathy about their meeting with Sean and Sean's report on it. And um, we talked about the goals for the um, reconsideration of the rate structure, which is not going to be done as Lynn pointed out in time for the next year um, when we set FY23 rates, but that we need to move forward so that we can do something for the FY24 rates hopefully and uh Order i think progress. he's back <laughs> back from the back from the dead <laughs> i did hear most of the discussion andy you're muted andy Andy, you're muted. Yeah. It's strange to see.
<laughs> now Andy's. <laughs> yeah, now you. Okay, I think that should take care of it. Well, uh, you're, Andy, you either have to turn off the mic on your computer or hang up your phone. Because we're getting feedback. We're getting a loop. I think. I think Andy, if your phone is on speaker, then you might just want to mute your phone because it seems like your microphone is picking up. Um, you're muted in both places now. I'm having a problem because, okay. Let's see if that made me disappear. Can somebody say something and let me see if I can hear you? That's sure. better now, yeah. Yep. You're yep. fine now. We can hear you. See, the problem that I'm having is, is that I'm not getting sound out of my computer. So you, and I you don't can. know what the problem is. I was trying to avoid having the, I couldn't get to an easy, get to my settings easily to find out. So now I can't, it, I can't hear. So your your other method with phone worked. So, he could just do phone. <laughs> Why that is, I don't know. Let's take a break for a minute or so. And let me see if I can go through settings on my computer and see if I can figure it out. Maybe that'll do it. Can somebody say something again? Can you hear us now? Yep, got it. Uh, mm -hmm. For some reason, it had, once I went into settings, so I think I've now solved the problem and I'm off from the phone. So thank you for patience. Bernie, your hand is up. Uh, yeah, this is maybe um, an aside. I, I don't know what we, I honestly don't know what we use for technology, but, um, I mean, certainly when we come, it comes to reading meters, we should have, everybody should be on a remote read so that you just have to drive by and get the meter reading or have the, the meter phone home and phone it in. And some of the technology yeah, is, is old technology that's out there that, that does leak detection. Uh, so when water use jumps in a home, the uh, homeowner gets a note automatically saying, your, your, your water use has gone way up. Uh, both those are helpful. Can I respond to that, Andy? Yes. So I think, so we do have a lot of radio reads like that. Um, I think they're looking to move more as they swap out meters and they put new ones in. Um, and we have, I know Amy has looked into the, um, the possibility of doing a complete swap out for that type of, um, that type of meter where it detects the, um, the leaks where you basically can get an app on your phone that will give you an alert if your water usage uh you know goes above a certain point um and i think there's some communities that have done that and it's it is expensive so it would have to be you know it would have to be a capital project that would be funded through the through the enterprise funds um but i know it is something they're considering it's just sort of the timing of when we can uh fit that into the capital plan okay so um is there anything else we need to say on water in sewer rates now, or um, have we put enough uh, background out there and come back to it when we're able to do so? Because then we should turn to the other major issue, which is the uh, question of the parking policy. And I sent a, 
um, email to members of the committee that I'm going to repeat uh, just so that it's in public what the theme was is just explain to the committee that um, the, the committee report was was phrased as recommendations to the uh, town services and outreach committee also known as TSO and TSO essentially said thank you but and did not uh, accept the rate structure as proposed and the reason that they did so um, was not it was uh, not related to uh, failure to appreciate the consideration ought to be given to a different tiering structure but because the regulation is proposed as um, both suggested rate structure within the regulations, but also saying that the final decision on rates will be made by the town manager, that the town manager can make the decision to phase in more quickly and therefore it does not need to be within the policy that's being uh, proposed and passed by the council and uh, which uh, at the time got me thinking about that part of the policy too is to whether it is an administrative or legislative function to establish the rates and uh, especially remembering that we're dealing with the public way and we are the keepers of the public way. Uh, this came up in another part of the discussion that um, we had uh, with um, on, on a different topic the, at the last TSO meeting. And what Paul said very clearly was is, is that uh, there are times um, that the council has chosen to give discretion to the uh, town manager, which is perfectly appropriate thing for the council to do, because the council can always uh, now or a future council um, take that back if they find that the system is not working. So that was, uh, I think, the best response to what had been proposed and I, the uh, uh, question before us is, whether we feel strongly enough uh, about the recommendations that we made that we want to make a, um, make this as not just a suggestions to the TSO, but whether we want to turn it into a report to the council for Monday's meeting with um, actual recommendations. And uh, so that's sort of the introduction. And now it's uh, Kathy, your hand is up. So I'm gonna recognize you. Um, let me, I, I need to repeat back to you what I think I heard uh, about TSO. Um, did you say that they decided to take a pass on this, that they basically, we have a proposed new rate structure and they said they didn't feel they had to act on it because the town manager has, can go ahead and do this with out a council action is that what you said TSO had decided what TSO decided to do is that uh, the motion that was passed at TSO was to recommend the rate structure in the regulations as proposed okay by town staff and uh, that they did not make changes to have more rapid phase in okay uh, that we had discussed and okay. because they and that that's where they said the reason was that if more rapid phase in was um, was deemed to be an appropriate decision down the line by the manager then the manager could do it didn't need to, uh... okay so that I misheard. So they 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 approved what had they weren't saying that it wasn't within their purview. They approved what had been being what was being proposed. So um, I just 
to me, there is a there is a slight but subtle distinction between the finance committee and TSO. Um, this came up more than a year ago in the context of places that would increase the revenue to the town. You know, not you know, so it wasn't just focused on permits and Sean. And, find, and and the town said where they were already looking at this. So um, I would still like to have a discussion within this committee on whether we want to recommend a more rapid increase. And I, I see Sean's hand is up. The one thing he talked about during the hearing um, that did give me pause is that he was worried that we might just, um, if and I was particularly focused on resident without Amherst registration, um, not on the rest of the rate structure, that I felt that we could go up more rapidly, that that group doesn't really have an option. And that to me, one of the goals is to not have as many cars parked all the time on the street. Um, so it wasn't just to increase money for for the the permit thing, that that we were, in theory, going to have residents living downtown without cars, and it's turned out not to be true. Um, so that's just one point I wanted to make. I'm still interested in talking about a more rapid schedule increase. And then the other thing I heard that I hadn't been aware of is that the select board a while ago decided overnight parking was okay on streets. And I, um, I heard the rationale why. I would love to know what other towns do, um, because you know to park your car all night long, it basically uses the street as your parking place when you're doing that. So that's not part of this proposal at all. But I would like at some point to revisit that select board decision, not today. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, I'll comment on that uh, later. Uh... But I first want to recognize Sean and uh, Michelle. So, Sean? Yeah, the only thing I was going to, um, so I think at TSO that came up, Kathy, um, but it was more in regards not to the streets, but to the parking lots, um, the overnight parking. Um, so they did discuss that a little bit. Um, and the only thing I was going to add is another change that happened in TSO was the reserve spot permit. I believe when this committee first reviewed that, the the high end of this was 1250. Um, they recommended that it go up higher given what some of the comparables are. Um, so you'll notice, one thing you'll notice is that the reserve spot permit, um, the end result is higher than, than what you saw, I think the first time around. Um, we brought it up to $250, up to $1,500 uh, total. I like that. Um, Michelle? I wasn't able to make it to the hearing um, on this, and I'm just wondering what the general, uh, were there participants that spoke at the hearing or residents that spoke at the hearing, um, and what was the general sense from the public? I don't think we had any. <laughs> there wasn't a hearing on this. They were, they were stunned. They were stunned. There was no one. Speechless. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, there was a hearing, but no one spoke at the hearing. There weren't any speakers. <laughs> other, other than counselors. I mean, we had a right. discussion during the, but the, no, there wasn't, there wasn't an array of public speakers lined up on this issue. On this, um, yeah, I just, the reason I asked is, uh, as Andy sort of alluded to in TSO and uh, talking about another matter with, I think, I don't know if this is what he was alluding to, but the, the, rental registration fees, which is also another fee uh, item that we're looking at. And some counselors feeling like there needed to be more public input. And I guess I'm just as a newer counselor confused about like, where should there be hearings when we're addressing these things, especially if we're thinking about implementing changes more quickly. Um, and how are we getting, uh, at least making the public aware of that we're talking about these things. And I know this is like a bigger, broader discussion, but yeah. Andy, can I just add one quick thing to that? 
Yeah. Um, we did e use, um, so parking permits are now done online and we have the email address for everyone who has a parking permit. And we did send out the notice of the hearing and the general, um, the general focus of the hearing, which was to increase permit fees um, to everybody who has a parking permit. So nice. at least in terms of the people that were most impacted, uh, I think we reached them as, as best we could in this particular circumstance. So I think trying to, um, to, to answer the, the question real quickly about what this um, select board was reacting to mostly was that residential neighborhoods um, that because of uh, the way the snow regulation used to be, people in residential streets could not park cars during winter months at all. And um, the change was really um, focusing in that direction and the establishment of the system with uh, declaring snow emergencies and uh, notification through various mechanisms, including the official one, which is those blue flashing lights, but it's also, there are ways you can uh, subscribe to get notification by text or otherwise. And uh, the, um, but, but the goal was to not ban parking on residential streets for a substantial portion of the year when you're really trying to cover half a dozen days when there's a snow problem and just focus on that. And snow emergency parking is fairly common. Lots of cities use um, a snow emergency notification system. Uh, an exception was not made for the downtown area. So I think that there, um, if, if you're gonna go back and revisit the issue, uh, then uh, um, I would suggest from my experience having dealt with the ones before is to deal with it in two different ways. Think about residential areas, then think about the central business district. So um, getting back in, um, I think the question still with us is, and then uh, I see your hand just went up, Bob, is uh, to go through and look at the various things that we've had as recommendations or suggestions to the uh, uh, TSO and whether we want to report them as recommendations to the finance committee, uh, to the council directly for the Monday meeting. And that's gonna be what we have to focus on now because otherwise there's no action to be taken. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to, to I think you answered my question that, that to clarify that the, the recommendation or the, the discussions that we had Prior to this, we're only focused at input to the TSO. We're not directed at the council. Is that correct? That's the way that we did it. Uh, we okay. were asked for the first time. Yeah. And now I've raised the question for the finance committee as to whether the finance committee has any recommendations. Knowing what TSO's uh, recommendation was, does the finance committee? wish to make recommendations to the council directly prior to Monday's meeting. And uh, the uh, issues that we talked about, I think that um, everybody probably knows what they are uh, because we talked about uh, whether to implement um, the changes more quickly. Uh, and we had several members of our committee who suggested moving to a higher rate uh, faster and going to two-year phase in instead of three-year phase in. Um, there was a uh, question of whether that phase in should be differentiated between people who had cars that were registered in Amherst and uh, people who 
did not have cars recommended in Amherst. And uh, uh, there was a suggestion we made about making the rates um, phase in for people who don't have cars in Amherst more quickly. Uh, we had some discussion about the Boltwood garage and uh, whether, again, a more rapid phase in, which was the one thing that, as uh, Sean pointed out, they did deal with at TSO by proposing a higher end rate. Um, and uh, there was Kathy's suggestion about um, trying to uh, have um, parking places reserved only for weekday daytime and not um, all around the clock. And uh, that was discussed in the committee, but no position was taken, our committee rather. Um, and uh, then uh, whether there should be a reduction in the number of reserved underground spaces was uh, at least also mentioned in our prior report. So those were, I think, that the issues that came up as um, things to report to the uh, TSO, and they are included in the report. Kathy? Okay. I'm since I was the one starting the conversation, or I was one of the ones starting the conversation of more rapid, looking at the two proposals we have in front of us, I was going to recommend only one change compared to what's called proposal one. I like what TSO did on, on the reserve spot permit. So my one recommendation, rather than dealing with phasing more rapidly on everything would be the phase more rapidly on the resident with non-resident registration. Um, just that one line. So I'd like, to, uh, so if we, that would, that's my suggestion and recommendation and whether it goes immediately from 25 to 400 or goes from 25 to 300 and then 400, but make the phasing more rapid and the Rationale that I have is that um, a lot of those cores, my belief are residents that are only here for a short period of time, they're students, and that's why they didn't re-register their car. Their alternative, potential alternative is a UMass parking lot and 400 is about the right number for a UMass parking lot. Um, that's what they would have to pay, although those lots are full. So I think we're giving away our, our permits too cheaply. And I don't think we should be encouraging parking on the streets. So uh, that's the one I would do because they always could re-register their car and get the lower rate um, if they want to. And then they'd be paying us an excise tax. So I was going to focus just on that one row um, and make that would be my recommendation as uh, as the only difference between finance committee, if others are with me, and what TSO voted out. I will stop there. Hopefully that was clear. It was just because we we rightfully proposal two does what had been suggested is a more rapid phase in. Um, for each of the lines with immediate increase in this. So instead of giving up on the others, leaving the resident as the slow phase in, the employees as the slow phase in, and the reserve spot permits as is written in the TSO proposal one. I will stop. Hopefully that was clear. Yeah. Um... Uh, see what Michelle wants to say, and then I uh, have Sean explain the chart a little bit on the screen and why we why he did that, uh, which was actually at my request. But uh, Michelle, that might be helpful, yeah, for me. Um, and I, so I was just curious, Kathy, with your rationale. Um, so, are you saying that the non Amherst registration in your mind is mostly students and where is that data coming from? Um, the data is coming from who are the residents of 
the big apartment complexes downtown. And what you can see, you can see a variation that often the people have them for just a year. They're not here for long term. Um, so my bet is the reason you're supposed to change your car registration when you're a long term resident. You're not supposed to sit here with a non um, and, and a lot, some of these cases, the regis car registration isn't even a Massachusetts registration. Um, right. it's not a, so that's my guess. And so I was doing the two things. One, you have the option of changing your registration and you could be at the lower rate if you do that. Um, so you're both avoiding an excise tax and you're likely not here for very long. So we're not hitting someone who's a long time downtown resident. So it is an assumption, Michelle, but um, uh, what I didn't know, and I think Sean told me, when you get a permit, I thought you had to give your plate number. So we would, but you probably don't have to say whether you're a student, you know, and, and one more piece of information, UMass in Lowell, you can't get a permit to park on the street unless your car is registered in Lowell. They just have a, you can't get it if you aren't a resident by registering your car. So they put an outright, you can't get one of these. Um, so they're much tougher than what's being proposed here. You can still get access to a on-street parking permit. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll just say as a student um, at UMass who came from Pennsylvania, um, I don't think I really thought <laughs> about changing my registration or even knew that that was something I should consider doing. And I did have a car here most years. So I'm just curious kind of what the awareness or what the educational component might be in terms of and, and what would it take for a student to register in Amherst and then go home for the summer to their other state that they live in or this, their permanent state. And, you know, what are the consequences of that? So. Yeah. And I, just, just one more thing, you know, we, when we put the, that you could build a large apartment complex downtown and not have to provide parking, the argument would be, was that many of these people might be students and they could walk to campus and there was no need for a car. That's why they didn't have to create parking places. So there was, so, and then when the complexes opened up, they actually discovered $25 was a pretty good rate. <laughs> and uh, rather than, and the complexes said, where can you get parking permits? And they said, well, you can park at the UMass lots. These are available to you, or you could, go downtown and get one for $25. $25. It was a really good deal. And you can see um, that's where the, the variation, the other thing you can see is the variation in those buildings, because I think some of them when COVID hit didn't come back, you know, so we had fewer permits being taken out during the COVID period. It wasn't the long time residents. So it is an assumption that I'm making ab about those, but it uh, I felt that the we don't need more cars parked on our street. I want to treat the treat those as precious spaces. I want visitors, people are coming for a short amount of time to come down and park in them. So I'm part of my goal would be to open up the street a little bit um, by making it more expensive to buy one of these. I'll stop. So um, I guess let me have Sean go next and explain the chart and the financial implications uh, for the transportation fund uh, that would come from that change. Sean? Yeah, and just um, I just wanted to add to what Kathy said. I think the, the issue with the non amherst registration um, I think the primary focus were was for vehicles that were registered in other Massachusetts cities, not in Amherst, because um, in those instances they're paying the excise tax either way. It's not a it's not whether they're paying it. It's just what community receives it. Um, and our feeling is if they're here ten months of the year, then our community should receive it um, as opposed to 
the two months of the year. Um, and and to your point, Michelle, I think we can provide education or provide some um, information when people are registering for the permits um, to to outline exactly what you said is how how do you switch your registration if you want to um, and what what does that process look like? So we can um, if these changes are approved, we can look into how we can provide that education at the time people sign up for permits. Um, uh, yeah, we could do that at our through our collector's office. Uh, so this. This chart, again, it compares proposal one to proposal two. So proposal one, uh, the first black box shows you our current structure and an estimate of the quantity of permits at each um, for each type. Um, another correction that you'll see here from the memo that you saw is we actually have 28 reserve spot permits, not 20. I think the first version you saw showed 20. Um, so that's corrected here. The second black box shows the pricing for 2023 and then 2024 and 2025. Um, so in the first one, it's a three-year phase in for all of the different price structures. So uh, resident with Amherst registration goes from 25 to 50 to 100 to 150. Um, and you can see what the, the similar transition plans are for the other types of permits. Um, and then the green line totals up the revenue from the permit system for that year. Um, and you can see how that revenue grows over the, the three years to uh, ultimately to 2025, where we would reevaluate um, fee levels at that point. Proposal two, um, instead of doing it over three years, you'll see that it gets up to the, the end point in 2024 instead of 2025. So again, looking at that first one with Amherst registration, um, you'll see it gets up to 150 by 2024. Um, so it just, it goes one year quicker. Um, except for the resident permit with non-Amherst registration, that goes immediately to the max price. Um, I think that was the, the initial proposal was to not do a phase and for that to go right up to that, um, the full amount. So for that resident non-Amherst registration, you'll see it goes from 25 all the way up to 400 all at once. Um, so accelerating the, the transition plan will, um, assuming the one thing we can't speak to or we can't say with certainty is that the the number of permits won't change between the two proposals um, in terms of if, if it goes up faster, will that impact how many people uh, apply for permits? So for this comparison, we just left the number of permits the same under both proposals, um, but that's one variable we can't, we can't guarantee. Um, but raising the prices faster will we'll bring in more revenue, uh, we'll bring in revenue more quickly. Um, and so for 2023, it would bring in $73,000 um, more for 2023 and then for 2024 would bring in $32,000 more. Uh, and then by 20, by 2025, they're at the same level. Um, so in total, proposal two would bring in about $106,000 more um, over those three years. So Andy, I can't raise my hand because I'm showing the screen, okay. but I'd like to ask, I'd just like to clarify. So Kathy, what you're suggesting is we stay with proposal one, except with regard to the resident with non Amherst registration. Correct. And what are you proposing that we do instead of what's in proposal one? Are you proposing that we do proposal two? Um, well, I, I'd be happy to think either way. So faster. So right now, Proposal two goes all the way up from 25 to 400. So we, with the others, that's what we had discussed doing. So would we instead go um, in a three-year phase? And so would it go 25 to 150 to 400 or 25 to 300 to 400? Either one, I just think it should be more rapid. Um, and right now it goes all the way to the end point. I'm comfortable with the endpoint, the 400. So just getting to it faster, Lynn. So, um, so let me just say, Kathy, I think your rationale about what what does it cost to park a car on a UMass Amherst campus, as why we should raise it rapidly and continue to look at it, um, is actually spot on. I mean, this is what they're going to pay. And they can't, you know, they can't get a parking space on Amherst, on U UMass Amherst's thing. So I think what you're, I'm just trying to get to the point, we have a motion. Yeah. The motion would be to 
stay with proposal one, except with regard to what is in proposal two for residents without Amherst registration. Correct. That would be the motion. Um, okay. I can make the motion, um, but that is to stay with proposal one, except for resident non with non Amherst registration. In this case, don't phase in, but go immediately to 400. Okay. I'll second that. The, the motion that I have is to recommend proposal one. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Recommend proposal one, except. Got it, thank you. The one line that's in yellow. Um, okay, so this motion has been made and seconded on the floor. And uh, the Michelle has her out. hand up. Yeah, Michelle, Michelle has her hand up. Yeah, I just. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not. Uh, we're not getting to voting. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we're discussing the motion at this point, and uh, I guess that the uh, we should be clear about what the rationale is when we uh, for phrasing the report. That was the point that I was going to get at, Michelle. Um, so this is the discussion within the within the motion. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Um, before getting to voting, I just want to say that I I don't feel I can support this. Um, uh, I appreciate um, what you're trying to do here, um, but I I just I don't think that it is. I just don't think that it's fair to sort of create such an immediate increase when. These students have been, whether it's right or wrong, you know, um, and I don't even want to use those words, just whether it makes sense or not that they're paying $25 right now, I think to just move them up to 400 and, you know, like that is just, I don't feel comfortable with that. So I won't be able to support this. What would you, uh, how would you phase it in if you were doing it as a phase in? I mean, I don't really see a difference between, it, these fees haven't been increased and that, I don't know who was sort of, or what, what reason that was, you know, it just didn't happen, the town didn't do it or whatever body was responsible for doing it didn't do it. Um, so I feel like we should um, increase it uh, however we're going to increase it equitably throughout all of the categories. I don't feel like because UMass students would have to pay for, I mean, that's sort of to me feeling like bordering on saying, well, they can't get parking at UMass, so why don't we even increase it more? You know, like, I just think that's a slippery slope and I just... I feel like it doesn't, it's not, I don't think it's worth the money um, to do that. I just think that we should increase everybody at the same, at the same level, at the same cadence. Um, so I, I feel like uh, proposal one is the one that I feel more comfortable with. Yeah, I think. I just speak to it again, Andy, for your so you can have it in your report. They have an option, and that's to register their car in Amherst. Um, and in Lowell, you can't get a resident parking permit for the downtown street unless your car is registered. And that was the first question I asked when I found out about permits. I was stunned that we weren't requiring you to be a resident with a resident uh license plate. Um, so it, there is an option here to only pay $100 um, it, or $50 to have a very uh, slow increase. So I don't think it's um, arbitrary. We are allowing something that at least one other, I couldn't find, I don't know what New Haven does, what some of the others do, which have large student populations. But um, I tried to find Burlington. I just found Lowell as an example where 
there was just a strict, if you want a downtown parking permit as a resident, you have to have an Amherst registration, you have to have a Lowell registration. So I think um, that's my rationale because I think we don't even have a cap on how many permits we give out. We just give them out. Um, so I think we need to keep our streets open for people to come to restaurants, for people to come at night. So you, um, it's, it's an important policy decision on making sure there are places to park. So I'll just, I'll stop. Respond yeah. to that. Is that okay? Oh, I see. I'm sorry, Sean. But would it be okay if I respond to that real quick? Sure, um, I, I think that parking is a problem, like a bigger problem that we need to solve and that we've been having conversations in the town about, um, especially as, you know, as you said, Kathy, I agree. We want to have places for people to come and visit and to park. And that's why we're talking about other things like garages and things like that. Um, I just, I don't, I, I feel like if we sort of at least did some education to get that out there and some awareness to get that out there, that folks would have that option to be able to register in Amherst. But my concern is also, you know, this sort of other that we, I, that I feel like we make of the students, like they're part of our community. Um, and I, I just personally feel like we could think about them, um, think about student residents as part of the fabric of our community. Their families come and park down and, and use our restaurants and our businesses. And, um, you know, so, I just, I'm not sure necessarily that I can um, agree with the rationale. I just want to say this is not anti-student. It's just a resident without a residential license plate. And Sean gave us information on our excise tax. We are really low in Amherst, given the number of residents we have with cars. And it's partly because we're not enforcing, if you're here a year, you're supposed to change your residence. We, we are low on that as an income. Um, he had a really nice piece in the original memo we got. So we there is an option for getting a $50 permit here. Just register your car in Amherst. Um, so it, it's not a focused, we don't want you. You have an option. So I just, and the excise taxes will be relative to how new, your car is and the value of your car. So you do have an option for a much lower rate. It's not a uh, pay this or hold your peace. So I, I will stop, but I, I just wanna create a rationale on, I think we're already being permissive to allow you to get a parking permit without, without registering your car. Um, not every town does that. Um, and all you have to do is register your car. It's not that hard. It's just an extra step. So I'll stop. Sean? Yeah, I was just gonna, I, I don't think this group should do anything with this right now, but since Kathy brought up the issue of demand and, and caps, um, that may be something we do have to look at in the future. Um, the the development on Spring Street has started again, started um, work again. I think they're supposed to be done sometime ne early next year. Um, and that property, I believe, is entirely, there, there's no parking on that on that site. Um, so I'm not sure quite how many units are in there, how many um, residents it'll bring, but that unit will likely be exclusively permit parking. Um, so it's something we'll, I just wanna let this group know that we'll continue to monitor that. And if we start hearing concerns around um, inability to find permit parking, cause that's, you know, sort of in the heart of where a lot of our permit parking is um, that we, you know, we may have to consider a, an upper cap at some point. The other piece that I, want to add to that and I'm sorry Bernie but they're going to start construction on the other high rise in downtown mm -hmm. I, I hesitate to call a five story building a high rise but the other apartment in downtown and that's going to take up that lot that is used a lot it's, so we've got two major changes going on downtown uh, that in this next year and the North um, Common space. I actually support what Kathy's suggestion, suggesting. So I just want to be clear. Bernie? Uh, Lynn, Lynn I, I thought the 
term was skyscraper. Um, That's it. <laughs> uh, I, I think um, I, I'm supporting what uh, Kathy's suggesting here, and I don't see this as necessarily anti-student. Um, it's an economic proposition. We have a scarce resource, parking spaces. Um, we are willing to uh, acknowledge if you have a car registered in Amherst that you're already compensating the town for the presence of, of your vehicle and the wear and tear it puts on the street. Um, so so um, uh, I, I think it's a fair compromise. I, I'm always concerned that we try to find ways to uh, um, carve out certain groups whenever we come up with a proposal like this. Um, uh, I think that's that's a slippery slope. We make life a little bit too complicated. Um, and I know going back to the dark ages, um, 50 years ago, <laughs> When I, I, get, I became, a, I moved to Amherst because I went to UMass and 50 years ago when I first moved to Amherst, before I moved into town, I had changed my uh, uh, voter registration and my vehicle registration. So it's, and that was back when we had to do things by paper and put things in the mail. Uh, so it, it's not a difficult thing to do. Um, so I'm, I'm supporting getting so. so Michelle? Is there, is there some way that we could, if, um, you know, a, a person with a non-Amherst registration gets their bill, it's $400, right? I don't know exactly what the timing of, of all of that is or how that works, but so they've been paying 25, now they're going to be asked to pay 400. Um, and I heard you, Sean, say that you could send them information that says if you'd like to you know become an register in Amherst here's what you can do is there some sort of grace period that can be offered so that I mean how would they have to just get in and I'm just thinking about college students and sort of you know is there what period of time would they have to to to, to do that between the time when they got their bill to when they'd get a fine for being late or whatever. Yeah, so it's okay, Andy, if I respond to that. Yes, go ahead. I believe they pay for it now at the time when they apply for the permit, which is on um, on OpenGov, so it's all done online. Um, I can, I, I won't have a good response for you today, but I can talk with our collector about ways for at least this first year um, to maybe provide some buffer um, in that process. I know it's, they're always worried about simplicity and the, the administrative um, impacts of, of making too many types of um, extra steps or uh, things like that. But I can talk to her more about ways we can try to get the word out there and, and provide sort of a little bit of a grace period to, um, if they want to switch their plates or things like that, that they don't get penalized. But the good thing is there is no um, there is no upper cap at this point, so it's it's not if they you know, don't get it in by a certain point that they're gonna lose their spot. They they can still go for it. But I'll, I can talk with her more about if they buy it and then they do register in Am Amherst, what options they have um, at that point. Yeah, particularly for the folks who have been that already have one, and that this is going to be like a shock for them to right. you know as they renew. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess one thing I'd ask is you, when you talk um, with the uh, collector about it is uh, whether there's a way to um, prorate it by month. Um, if people make a switch during the year, can they uh, either get a refund or um, do a monthly proration so that they have some time to make the change. The other thing that I was going to point out, and this is just based upon my own experience as a student, which is a long time ago, is because uh, I was like Michelle coming from another state to where I went to college. Uh, one of the reasons to not change uh, registration was uh, comparing which car insurance rates are whether you can, uh, whether you'll end up paying a higher car insurance rate and whether that'll lead it up. 
And I think that depends upon where you come from. If you come from a Boston suburb, the answer is going to be no. If you're coming from, you know, small Berkshire town, I'm not sure. But I don't think we can solve everybody's problems. We just have to make the wisest decision for the town and the fairest decision for the town. Is there anything else to be said? Otherwise, we have a motion that's been made and seconded on the floor. And I would first go ahead and move to a vote if I don't see any more hands. Seeing none, then um, we'll um, start, um, I'll just start the vote and do it alphabetically. Uh, Lynn? Yes. Bob, uh, and whether you recommend. I'm sorry, did you call on me? Yes. Yes, I recommend. Uh, Matt is not with us, uh, so. Uh, Matt did uh, join. I think Matt is here, yeah. Wait, is, Matt, is Matt? Yes, he, he joined. He joined a few, um, like maybe twenty minutes ago. Okay, Matt, do you have um, you have a recommendation? Matt, he might have had a step away. Um. Okay, uh, Bernie. Recommend it. Uh, Michelle. Yes. Kathy. Yes. And I'm a yes. And uh, Alicia is, a, is absent. So at this point, um, we have unanimous four votes yes, two recommend, and two members uh, not participating in the vote. So, so um, Andy, could I just ask that for the purposes of the council meeting, Sean, could we prepare this as option one being TSO's recommendation and then change option two to be um, the finance committee's recommendation and show everything that's from option one, except what we just voted for option two. And just okay. to clarify that, it, it's the same as proposal one, except for um, the non-Amherst registration will exactly. come in I, immediate, I just want immediately. A nice, I just a want nice to confirm, is it immediately for 2023 or is it a two year yeah. phase in? Yes. It's, it's immediate, okay. Yeah. And then I just want a nice chart so that the council can look here and here. Okay. Is this is this chart okay? Just updated. Um, uh, with just the update proposal two so that it's okay. identical to proposal one. Except, except for that change. For that other change. Thanks. And I and I think Lynn, keep the yellow, keep it yellow so that you yeah. can see that that's the only line that's different, Sean. Yeah, I can do that. And the other thing that you might want to do is. Uh, change the wordings in proposal one and proposal two to TSO recommendation and finance committee recommendation. So okay, that sounds good. And uh, the um, other thing that uh, I would probably do in the report, which I'll write with Kathy since uh, she's the one who's been doing this is to say that um, we are looking that, that we've also requested in the finance committee that we look at the ways in which we can um, allow proration during the first year so that people um, don't have to make a decision to buy a $400 permit if they're going to change their registration, that if they change their registration, that they get uh, prorated credit. 
Is that uh, a yeah, fair if, statement? I think if 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 staff can figure out an easy way to do it, so just at least um, allow them to figure yeah. out what's doable. Yeah, I wouldn't want that to be. We'll we'll by the time we meet with council, I sh I should have an answer for the council on that. Well, you know, and when you you show up to rent an apartment, and your lease starts in July, um, you don't say to the apartment uh, owner, "Well, you know, I'm not going to be here until September when school starts." Um, I, I, yeah. So, you know, I understand that people want to be sympathetic, um, but not all renters, not all um, temporary residents or students, and uh, people need to be able to plan for some of this stuff. And I would so, just say uh, they don't have to, you don't have to buy a permit on day one. You just don't get to park your car in a permit right. parking spot. Yeah. So if you if you need a couple months, you don't have to pay that fee on because we right now we don't have a limit on the number of permits. So you could say I'm going to wait and re-register my car and I'll pay it in November. You know, so so to Bernie's point, you know, this is a a privilege to be parking on our streets and you can choose uh, when you want to slot in. So, Andy, I would write that sentence really carefully because I just think they don't they don't even have to show up on the first day permits become available. If we ever put a cap on permits, they would have to because it would be first come first serve on them. But right now we're uh, it's it's uh, expandable. Yeah. Well, Andy, what I'm gonna, I, I will write um a version of the report uh at least this section that, that we're just now discussing um immediately and so that it gets out to the committee the committee has a chance to comment on it and make suggestions because uh that is what the process ought to be for the report and on this one i think it's really important because it is uh I think the one thing that we've had some additional discussion on, Sean. Uh, and just so everyone knows, so, so these changes would become effective September 1st, I think is the first month of the new permit cycle. Um, so if they're approved in the next month or so, we'll have plenty of time to get the word out. Um, and I, I think another thing we can try to use again um, is the open gov email notification system to all our existing permit holders to Michelle's point of returning people being surprised by it. Um, we may be able to get some information out to all the existing permit holders and, you know, especially around the registration issue. Okay. Anything else uh, anyone has to say on this subject? Because uh, if not, uh, Wanted to see. I haven't looked to see if there's anyone in the audience at this point. And, uh, if there's one attendee, and uh, attendees, uh, uh, you have your hand up. So you want to comment? Uh, why don't you bring Dorothy in so she can comment? Whoever's hosting. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. I just want to say it's been very useful listening to the conversation. Uh, first of all, reminding me what we did do at TSO and um, seeing how we can move forward on this in a reasonable way. I, I think you've had a, it's been very helpful. I think you've had a good discussion. And uh, the discussion on the water rates at the beginning, um, one thing I didn't see said was, is, isn't there to be a differential rate for somebody who is watering for lawn purposes? Um, I know some towns um, do not rate them as agricultural. Uh, they, in fact, sometimes don't want them to do that if there's a water shortage. So uh, I, I have no idea if you even know who ha have that separated out. Sean, do you know the answer to that? Uh, so that would be part of the I think when we're looking at the rate structure going forward, that would be part of if we want to have a differential rate for that. Just Hadley did that years ago. I'm sure there are other towns. Unfortunately, Ty and Bond no longer does, doesn't seem to have an updated version of their water and sewer rate studies. So it's it's hard to tell um, from a you know, broader perspective, but yeah. 
the, the whole idea behind two meters for residential was if you're going to water your lawn, you pay more for it. So that was a very helpful comment, Dorothy. Thank you. Um, you know, this is something that was not for that was for informational purposes. It's not being proposed for any changes for um, the year that we're um, coming up on. That we're using the same rate policies for um, getting proposed rates to the council for FY23. And we're looking at these kinds of policy changes to propose for consideration and discussion for FY24 so that there's time within the finance committee and the council to fully consider all of the issues. Um, I see there's one other person who just joined. I don't, again, if there's any public comment, otherwise, you know, please raise hands and uh, otherwise. I think that uh, we had one additional item on the agenda, and um, Sean, you had uh, wanted to uh, present the um, some of the, the future plans for the committee. Yeah, so I wanted to um, share two things. I wanted to look at the budget, the overall budget calendar, which includes finance committee and town council meetings, um, and see if there's you know if there's any disagreement on those dates, um, and then bring up the finance committee specific agenda, which ties to this, but has some separate items that need to be considered. So um, I'll just walk through it quickly. I think the easiest way to walk through it is to um, kind of take each topic that needs to be acted on separately. Um, so the first topic that we need to, uh, that this group needs to handle is the regional school committee budget. So right now, the way the calendar works is the regional school budget and related debt would be presented to the council on April 4th, and it would be referred to finance committee. Uh, finance committee would review it on April 12th. There would be a public hearing at the town council meeting on the 25th of April. That um, it would be, a, it's a council meeting, but finance committee would hold, um, schedule the, the pre-meeting hearing. Um, and then finance committee would reconvene on April 26th to finalize the recommendation to the council um, based on whatever they heard at the hearing. And then town council would act on the regional budget on May 2nd, um, which it needs to, um, originally we had this for later in the month, but in order to stay within the 60 days that's required, um, if the council wants to act on the debt of the regional school district, um, it would have to act on it on this May 2nd meeting. So that would be the full regional process. I guess maybe it's easy to take, easier to go through questions on each process. Is there any questions on the regional school committee process, regional school budget? Um, Sean, you said May 2nd, but you've got us down for a meeting on May 3rd. So May 2nd would be a council meeting. Oh, so it's at the council meeting. Okay. All right. So, so the, okay. this group would make its recommendation on April 26th. Um, okay and in advance of the council meeting on May 2nd to vote. And at, at that council meeting, they'll vote on the assessment method, um, the budget, and then it will have a choice of whether or not to um, vote on the debt. I think the practice in the, pa the past couple of years has been to vote on the, on the debt authorization. And just so people know, if you're not aware, um, the regional school committee, the debt authorization this year is a little bit different um, because of the track and field project. So just a heads up on that. Um, you may want to take a look. Um, we'll, we'll have that motion wording ready pretty soon. Um, the, the way the school committee voted it was they authorized a certain amount for the track and field project. And there's some, some contingency language around if additional funds are raised by a certain point, um, the regional school committee can move forward with the, the larger track and field project. And if those funds aren't raised by that point, they would move forward with the smaller track and field project. So I think it was actually um, smart the way they crafted it to kind of leave flexibility and not require um, a decision at this point. But just so people know, it's a little bit different than the language is, is a little bit unique. So that's the regional school process. Um, so uh, the, hang on, there's yeah. two, before you get, go oh. beyond that. Um, superintendent, uh, Mike and uh, Doug Slaughter, will they be with us at the finance committee meeting on the 4th? 
Yeah. So I, so I've sent this, I've sent these draft dates to them um, and told them that, you know, we'll let them know if they don't need to attend any of these meetings, but to plan to attend um, at this point, all of the, all of the dates that have the regional school district budget. Um, I don't know if Matt has uh, rejoined us uh, or not, but um, we're going to go ahead and say what I'm going to say. But, uh, he had raised a question that he would like to have a finance committee discussion of what happened at the last four town meeting and what is envisioned for uh, the assessment method um, and its impact going forward. And uh, there was, I had, I missed that meeting because I, that was just after I had the worst part of my health crisis. Um, so I was not at that four towns meeting, but there was discussion about uh, presentation about guardrails. And I think that it was a, uh, sort of phrased as needing to have a better understanding of what that means and what the projections are for future years. And so we really want to have the presence of the superintendent and school finance director and uh, have them aware uh, that that is anticipated to be some of the questions that we would look to, to answer because I essentially um, suggested to Matt that we do it as a part of that meeting so that we can do it with uh, when school staff are present. And Andy, so that discussion would happen, I think the bulk of that discussion would happen on April 12th. Um, and if there are, if it's okay with you, Andy, if there are, if anyone has specific regional budget questions um, that they want to hear addressed, if they send them to Andy and I, we can get them to um, the school, the school district and make sure, you know, so if multiple people have the same question, we can kind of synthesize it um, and get also, those questions. I also want to interject that at that regional school committee, there was a very strong um, reference to the fact that what we're seeing right now is this first year and that over the summer, once we get the budget passed, there would be a further discussion about the guardrail concept uh, in a four town public either subcommittee or committee, but that um, the proposal this year keeps us at 2.5. I don't want to get into my concerns about out years. I have them, uh, but we had also really heard from the superintendent and agreed at that meeting that the discussion about how this would work in out years would be after this year's budget. Right. And this proposal only, um, the, the assessment uh, method is only for 2023. So what is, if it's approved this year, it does not obligate the town to go this method beyond 2023. Great. And let me ask, uh, I see that Matt has his hand up and Kathy too. So, um, I'm gonna ask my, take the privilege of asking the question uh, first on the uh, capital request. Is the thought behind all of this that the schools would renew a request to for CPA funds as one of the sources that might enable them to go for a larger track and therefore that the uh, capital request as is presently stated, that would default to the smaller track if necessary, um, because no additional funds is raised, is really um, a projected future town expense. That we would anticipate that it not be shared with CPA. Yeah, so I think the the their plan is to consider other funding sources beyond the regular regional um, capital process, one of which would be CPA. Um, so they currently have a CPA request that's been sort of put on hold until they could um, get clear what option they're pursuing um, with the expectation that they would come back to CPA at some point to, uh, and if you look at this, the CPA report, I think it says something to that effect around that, 
request being on hold. Okay, Matt. Uh, good morning, and sorry I had to join a little late. So to Lynn's point, um, I thought the discussion at the Four Towns meeting was really clear that we would move into a working group over the summer and that like kind of look at the long-term implications. And I really wasn't quite as concerned then. And then a piece ran in the Gazette shortly afterwards that sort of mentioned the popularity of this 4% guardrail idea and, and didn't sort of, you know, I mean, not that you ex expect the press to capture every little nuance, but I do think that, you know, in, in years that are not supplemented by federal aid, um, you know, that 4% number can be, very important for us to, to keep an eye on and, and to work. So, you, you know, I, I think, as Sean said, you know, talking about this year is on the 12th is, is fine. But I, I also, um, the other thing that I, re I picked up in the meeting was that had we been meeting in person, there would have been time for individual um, towns or councils to sort of meet independent of each other and have, you know, some of those more frank discussions uh, separately. And, and in the Zoom format, that wasn't permissible with open meeting um, restrictions. So I, I just felt like there are a couple of nuances that we as a finance committee might want to put our attention on, you know, off, off of the, this very clear set, sort of cycle schedule that Sean has brought, but, but sort of lar larger, longer term um, discussions. And I leave it up to, you know, your judgment as to when the best time is to, to talk about that. But I do think it, it merits, you know, uh, a specific conversation. Um, you know, I don't know if you have any response to that, Sean, otherwise I'm going to go ahead. To... No, I think that's absolutely right. I think we've, we've got to do this for this year, but the summer, I think, is the time to dive in and really, you know, whoever the representatives are from Amherst that are part of that group um, need to really look at the long-term implications to Amherst. So I think that's right on. I think I phrased it also as long-term implications to um, the regional schools, which is a shared concern for hopefully for all four towns. But if the consequence of going to this, um, what's being proposed for this coming year as a long-term solution, is there a risk to regional school funding because the pressures that would be put on the regional schools to make sure that we have an affordable structure for all four towns each year. And um, so I worry about the schools too. Um, Kathy? Hi, um, I completely endorse everything Matt just said about having a meeting focus on this. And just one comment, I don't know on the Zoom, I don't know whether we'll, have to continue or whether we want to continue or will be able to continue Zoom. Zoom does have the capacity for meeting rooms. So um, it's a feature that was used with the school building where groups were parceled out to just their respective groups in a completely for that kind of private conversation. So we shouldn't, if we continue to meet in four towns and want to have those separate discussions, they were excellent, Matt, when we were able to break out, <laughs> you know, um, they and they're called breakout, I think, uh, in, in the way Zoom does it. But I want to just raise one other thing about um, the summer schedule that I think will come up a little bit when we talk about the capital budget. And it's a, I think we need, we'll need to go back and look at, you um, some thinking about the large capital projects as we model our resources. Um, and so I want to make sure we schedule Andy and Sean, figure out when is the right time to do that, because they did that discussion. The Sean developed a model for us to look at, and we've had to take it down temporarily uh, as we we're learning more about the cost of the school project. So I just want to make sure we pencil in some dates for whether it's July or August to have that discussion sooner rather than later. And Lynn may want to comment on, on. So this is this year's budget. I understand that, but it will come up. At least um, you'll see it in the JCPC report that we just finished um, with Sean's expert and Sonia's expert. We, we raised the issue of looking at the out years that we will probably will need to revisit 
those. Um, so I think we need to schedule some dates. That that was my only comment on it, not a suggestion on what date. And I don't mean in June. I'm, I'm not look, looking at the way we're meeting in, in May and June, but I think we need to be ready to have that discussion. Just briefly, Andy, if I may, some, I think there was a comment that the Zoom breakout rooms were a problem for open meeting law. Somebody had somebody indicated that during the conversation, and I don't know if that's true or not, but that was it seemed like that was the uh, motivation for not doing so. Athena, you might be able to comment on that. Sure. Um, if the different towns went in a breakout session, then they just have to have a minute taker. It would have to be open to the public, and I'm not sure that we could do all of that in an open meeting gets a little tricky when you can't have people jumping between those breakout sessions. I'd have to look more closely before we, um, with IT to see if we could allow public access to all of the different breakout rooms at the same time. Otherwise, um, yeah, it, it would be an issue. I, I also wanna just mention that having chaired the breakout sessions, we only get about 20, 30 minutes. It's really not enough for the kind of conversation uh, Matt, that I I agree with you totally. We need to have. Yeah. And, yeah, I do with, too. Uh, yeah. yeah. And with regard to uh, the model, Kathy, you're absolutely right. I'm, um, you know, waiting for Sean and Paul to indicate when they think it's ready. But there's going to have to be some um, meetings again about the model. And um, as we get more data, um, it keeps changing. I also, while I have your attention. I want to just say that I have talked with a couple of the people involved in the fundraising side of this, and they're very um, um, working hard to try to raise a significant amount of money because the cleared preferred option is the one that reorients the field um, so that you're not glaring into the sunset or sunrise for that matter. Um, so, um, and they are painfully aware of the challenge, but they have their booster club uh, working on it. So. Andy, can I keep going through the other processes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So, so the next one, oh, this is an easy one, um, water and sewer rates. So um, we, we, I think we pushed this back, Lynn, so you'll have to say if it's okay. Um, but as of right now, we would do the presentation of the water and sewer rates on April 25th to the council. And then they'd be referred to finance committee. Finance committee would discuss them on uh, the third and or the 10th. Um, and That's then, correct. Okay. okay. And then they'd be part of a recommendation and they would come back to the council um, for a vote on, on the... Um, 13th and I think if we I think we would um, we may need to put a hearing um, for the water and sewer rates uh, I'm not sure if we decided last year if we have to do a hearing or not but I think we chose to um, Athena what did we decide I don't believe we need a hearing for water and sewer rates but I think we did discuss it twice rather than um, waiving 8.4 okay great so we won't vote until after this it's it comes back to the council and then there'll be one meeting and then a second time. Yep. Okay. Then the next issue is the capital improvement program. So JCPC just wrapped up their work. Um, and so the town manager will present the capital improvement program to the um, council on May 2nd. And then it would be just and referred. It would be referred to the finance committee. Um, and then the finance committee would discuss it on the third and the tenth as well. That would those would be sort of the two major those two topics: water and sewer rates and capital improvement would would guide those two meetings. Um, then there would be a public forum on the capital improvement program on the sixth of June, and then it would be voted on the thirteenth potentially. And then the last uh, topic is the actual budget. So the budget would also be presented on May 2nd. Um, we would then have several finance committee meetings that would be focused on this. And you can see what we've marked out here for the, the departments that would come. And we've got a, a contingency meeting if we need an additional meeting. Um, we don't currently have a forum scheduled um, or 
hearing scheduled. I think it's a hearing in this case. I think we did the forum. Um, and so the so we would need to schedule a hearing or a forum. I get those confused. We need to schedule one of those on the on the operating budget, um, potentially on June 6th as well, if we wanted to keep them the same night um, and then vote on that on the 13th. And the qu one question for this group in particular, are those meeting dates for finance committee okay because in may we always get a very we have a very intense schedule um, and the other thing we've done in the past which will likely be needed this year as well is those meetings are typically three-hour meetings as opposed to two-hour meetings to allow sufficient time to get through all the all the departments um, so also recognizing that those meetings might be nine to twelve if we keep the same schedule and they're also on some weeks they're on tuesdays and thursdays um, yeah, so that's the big piece. I wanted to make sure see if there's any uh, challenges with this this finance committee schedule. Um, I personally yeah. have none, but I think we need to check with Alicia. That's what I was going to say too. Uh, so, so I can if if this group is okay with the schedule as is, I can send it out to the full group after and ask if there's any. Um, you know, if there's any conflicts. Yeah, no, and I'll I, try to be in touch too. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, I'll try to be in touch. Right. And then once once we finalize this, I will work with department heads to make sure they can, that they're available for these or flip them around as needed, but um, try to stick to the schedule. Okay, no, I, I... I appreciate the thought that you've given to it. And I think we all knew that we that May was going to be heavy. I've been clear with people about that all along. Uh, but obviously without exact dates, the charter and the state law say what they say. Right. So um, I guess for the counselors, do you think June 6th is okay for the hearing slash forum on the operating budget to do it the same night as the capital improvement program? I think that's makes sense. Okay. There's already just plan to be discussion on the budget. So, um, yeah. okay. I'll put that in there. Yeah, um, I have to go back and look at the charter again. This is a, but I, my recollection is, is that it's actually the finance committee. Right. It's charged by the charter with holding the hearing, hearing which we, yeah have typically done at council meetings, right? even though it's technically by the charter or finance committee hearing. I'll add that in if um, I'll confirm that as well and I'll add that in. Lynn, do you wanna bring up the finance committee specific schedule real quick? It, it'll, it won't take long. Uh, yep. I think it's the next tab over. Got it, hold on. There. Yes. So, um, so this mirrors mostly what was on the other sheet. The only th couple things that are added in here, um, we'll do the third quarter financial report on April 26th. That sh and, and Sonia's here and she'll yell at me if that's not the case, but um, that would be the goal would be to get to that on the 26th. And the other topic we have to add in sometime before June 30th um, is the optional um, exemption. Um, for seniors and the blind and, and, and veterans. So every year the finance committee has to um, has to make a recommendation to the council whether to adopt the um, optional exemption, which basically doubles um, the exemption amount for those certain groups. Um, so so Sean, if, if we can have a motion on that for mm -hmm. the April 25th meeting, mm -hmm. let's just do it as an... Um, consent agenda recommendation referral okay. to the council to the it's probably automatic but i'll check with things so let's yeah. just we ha make sure we have it by the time we do the budget that makes sense yeah all right so i um so again i'll send this out to the group i'll put the tentative time of nine um nine a.m to 12 p.m to make them three hour meetings um and then see if there's any conflicts from the group. 
Yeah. yeah. Can I also just, well, can I stop sharing this for a moment? Mm -hmm. And Matt, Matt has his hand up. I'm so sorry. I just, I missed that. The, the April 25th meeting is an evening meeting or a morning? That is an evening meeting. Okay. Right. Thank you. And if you want to hear the town, the superintendent of schools, full budget presentation, um, it will be on this coming Monday, April 3rd, April 4th, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. April and uh, it's going to be at eight o'clock. We're trying to set a, a time specific, probably 10 after eight, but um, the goal is to have a full presentation to the council on that day. It's a jammed packed meeting as usual. Uh, is there anticipated for, uh, I can't see any reason to uh, make it a finance committee meeting since it's going to be the next step is to refer to the right. finance committee. So uh, for those three of you, just be aware if you're interested in seeing that presentation in advance, just put on your calendar to attend the meeting as uh, attendees. So is there anything else? I think that we have um, done everything that was on the agenda for today's meeting. I don't have anything that was unanticipated 48 hours in advance. I don't know if anybody else has anything that they feel that needs to be addressed. If not, um, I will consider that, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody. It was a really good meeting. And uh, we pretty much met our 11 o'clock goal. So in order to do that for real, we should adjourn. So thank you. And thanks, Sean.